Good afternoon. It is so good to, to see some of you all. I see some of something happening in the chat. <laughs> I hope it was an enjoyment of some Bill Withers this afternoon. <laughs> um, but it is good to, uh, to be with you all. Today, we're going to discuss anti-racism as a professional practice. My name is Shalia Googe, and I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Beauvoir School in Washington, DC. And I'm Anna Carello, um, Associate Head of School at Beauvoir in Washington, DC. My sixth year at Beauvoir, Shalia and I have um, had the pleasure of working alongside each other for the last two years. And what we're gonna talk about today was actually um, part three of a four part workshop um, on anti-racism. And um, we wanted to tell you a little bit about Beauvoir first before we begin to kind of set the stage here. Beauvoir serves 404 students. Um, Early Learning Center has three month olds all the way to third grade. And our sister and brother school, St. Albans is all boys, four through 12, and National Cathedral School for Girls is four through 12, all girls. So we're the co-ed elementary school. And um, if you are a part of lower school or early elementary education, you can understand too that there are a lot of questions right now about how to talk to children about race and difficult conversations. Um, and similarly, we found that we needed to have that uh, literacy ourselves as professionals and educators in order to really guide conversations and be um, aware and confident engaging in conversations, not only with one another, but most especially with students. We will also say that Beauvoir is a um, racially diverse community, both in um, family, students, and faculty and staff. And um, we have been doing this work for quite a number of years, um, over a decade, leading the work on the cathedral campus and in the city. Julia, anything you wanna add about our work, just to give everyone an, a context for our conversation today? Absolutely. Um, I think you did an excellent job of, of teeing that up, Anna, and ultimately our responsibility as the adults in the lives of, of children. Um, and so this is definitely work that we've done with our faculty and staff community that we thought would also be beneficial to, to those of you that wanted to come to the conversation today. So our hopes for this conversation are that you take things away and can turn it around. Um, and just a little overview, we're, we're going to go through some expectations or some norms for this space since we are excited that you're here, but we also recognize that we haven't met you before. We wanna norm the space, um, share some expectations, and just level the playing field when it comes to how we'll engage with one another today for our conversation. Absolutely. Our first expectation is that we expect that each of us will lead with curiosity rather than judgment. We expect that each of us will actively participate to the best of our ability. And we also expect that each of us is going to feel discomfort, especially when we're talking about race. This is something that is scientifically proven in the research uh, for all um, racial identities. When we talk about race as humans, um, our stress levels increase. And Stevenson, Howard Stevenson out of the University of Pennsylvania is a resource that you could go to find more information about this. And what we really want everyone here to do is lean into that discomfort, knowing that in order for us to grow and find confidence, we have to explore those um, areas of discomfort first and use those areas as a catalyst for growth. And so, as we think about our norms to allow for all participants to feel seen, heard, and respected. We want each other, uh, we want to talk from the I perspective. So if you're sharing a story, um, please share using the I perspective or share a story that you yourself has, have experienced. And remember um, the importance of equity of voice. And when you're listening, honor the truths of others while holding confidences, right? What's said here stays here, but the learning that happens here can go with us. Absolutely. Are there more? Are there more that you'd like to add? And if so, please unmute yourself and add. Please add to the chat box. Um, I can't see, so you might need to say it out loud for me, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> but are there more to create the, the brave space that we're asking you all to enter today? Okay. Have I missed any in the chat, Anna? No, the chat is quiet right now. Okay. <laughs> Before we begin today, 
Um, we'd like to just speak the name of Patrick Warren Sr., a black pastor in Colleen, Texas that was murdered by police last week in his front yard while having a mental health crisis. And we also acknowledge the dual pandemic of COVID, which is why we're even in this virtual format this year, and systemic racism and injustice, which is why we've gathered in this workshop this afternoon together. And so one of the things that we value doing in our school community is checking in, recognizing that we're all coming into this space, we're all coming to this, you know, into this space differently. And so in order to check in, if you grab your cell phone or use your computer, we'd love to ask you in one word, how are you right now? Let's see. You should be able to, in the two section where you would put the phone number, put the numbers 22333. And then in the text box, you can send the text message, Shalia Gooch, 210 and all one word. Thank you everyone for sharing um, those words with us. It's good to get a pulse um, into how you're feeling. We'll carry all of those feelings with us in this conversation as well. Um, and this is a good time for us to pause. We're um, moving into uh, recognizing that um, feeling discomfort when talking about race is a natural condition for us. Um, so we want to pause and kind of set our mind and body in a place where we can uh, really listen and engage with the content. And to do that, we also wanted to, um, before moving into that mind-body piece, just pause and talk about why this topic in particular is so relevant right now. And when Shalia and I originally gave this presentation, um, you know, we were thinking about the Black at accounts on Instagram and how those testimonies from students and colleagues really highlighted that regardless of whether you are in a classroom or in an office space, independent schools were not a safe haven for our students of color and colleagues of color. And that means that we have um, a responsibility now to really dig deeper into anti-racism as a professional practice in our workspace. And so when we're working together with adults in a community, we really want to understand, respect, and appreciate all the identities that are being brought into that space and be responsible for the identity that we're going to bring into that space. And so we're asking all of you to come in to the space with your identities. We've set some expectations and shared some norms that um, this is going to be an inclusive group. And we want you to um, honor that as well. Um, Shalia, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the personal journeys and professional uh, identity we bring into the space just being in Washington, D.C. right now? Mm, absolutely, Anna. You know, our journey specifically as presenters, as we show up today um, to this virtual conference, we're in Washington, D.C. Um, and while neither of us are from the D.C. area, Beauvoir in particular has celebrated 86 years in the city. And so we're coming to this conversation with the insurrection two weeks ago, uh, more than fresh in our minds. Um, and we say that because the insurrection and the display of white supremacy in the nation's capital is still affecting our, our daily work and impacting our daily work. In addition to the news headlines um, that are you know, sadly slowly distancing their pace on shows and websites, we're balancing the fear of our faculty and staff right now who don't feel safe returning to work on Thursday. Uh, we're balancing roads that are being blocked uh, we're balancing navigating new ways to come into campus with those roads that are being blocked. Um, we're dealing with police and armored vehicles with thousands of additional servicemen and women coming into the city armed and the constant sounds of helicopters um, or low flying military air airplanes overhead. Um, so we acknowledge that's what we as presenters are coming into to this space with this afternoon and really relate to those words that were shared. Um, this is a connection sign that we use at Beauvoir with our students, especially on Zoom. So if you see me do that today, it's um, a connection sign with you. I'm feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. so, but not a reason to shy away from this conversation or to build up our skill and capacity um, in racial literacy. So now let's move into a space where we're really centering ourselves. Um, and Shalia is gonna lead us in an activity to find our heartbeat. 
Mm, thank you, Anna. And so as we think about how the mind and the body are so interconnected that what we think, feel, and believe actually affects our biological function of the body, both positively and negatively. And so we try to, we're trying to prepare our minds and bodies now with a moment to be mindful and to settle into this space mentally, spiritually, and physically. And so connecting with your heartbeat, um, we know that mindfulness practices help mitigate the stress experienced. And we will use mindfulness strategies in order to lean into the discomfort felt um, by many during stressful experiences related to race. And so take a moment to sit back in your chair and to find your pulse points and connect with your heart heartbeat. So find one of your pulse points, either just below your fingers on your wrists, your fingers to your neck, just below your chin or your hand over your heart. Listen, feel and breathe. And we'll stay here for about 30 seconds, silently connecting um, our mind to heart. So as a community today, we're creating opportunities that our students might or hopefully get through their classroom experiences. By engaging in conversation with one another today, this community provides us with windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. How many of you by a show of hands maybe are um, aware of the terminology windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors or your institution uses this to, to talk about equity and, and justice? Be a show of hands, I'll scroll through, okay. See a few folks. Okay. These might be phrases. Oh, good. I'm seeing that some digital hands, which is great. <laughs> um, oh, and a, a librarian here. Language for sure. Excellent. That's great. Uh, so for those of you who do use this language, um, Emily Style and Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop both wrote uh, at similar time periods about windows and mirrors. Emily Style really talks about windows and mirrors more specifically, and Rudin Sims Bishop talks about uh, sliding glass doors. But when we say this, for those of you who are not familiar with the terms, or when we use it, um, a mirror is anything that you can see, uh, an identity that you can relate to that is reflected back in yourself. Um, it's an experience that you have in common with what someone else, and um, you connect with someone in that way. Whereas a window is a racial identity or an experience that's different from yours. And these are important as educators for us to build not only in our communities, but as a librarian, uh, I'm not a librarian. I wish I, I had chosen that path, um, but I have such a, a, a love for, for librarians. You know, we curate books in our libraries that are intentional windows for our students. Um, and we should be thinking about that mindset too. What windows do I want to peer through and look into someone else's life? And then finally, the sliding glass doors. What's an identity or experience that you see, but that you really need to know more about before you're really willing and comfortable to engage um, more deeply in conversation or where you wanna understand. You see it and now you wanna open the door and know more. So as we're using that, those three terms in this metaphor of seeing a, someone reflected back into you or an experience reflected back on you, a window wanting to see through into someone else's experience and a sliding glass door, wanna open that door and learn more. Absolutely, and we can think about these as perspective taking strategies when engaging in conversations, especially around equity and justice um, and for our conversation together today. Is there one person that might be interested in sharing if this is not something that you use at your school, how you could see this being beneficial to your community or where you could see this playing a part um, in your equity and justice work as a school community? You can also use the chat, I just can't see it. <laughs> I don't see any hands up. Okay. Um, but we could also ask uh, colleagues here who have used it in your community. I think it's been such a wonderful um, tool for our community. And Elizabeth, I see your hand if you want to go ahead and unmute and share. It's been a great tool, as Shalia said, to adopt different perspectives, especially when we're talking about um, race, as people reflect and want to um, respectfully engage with others. Um, Elizabeth? Do you want to share? Is your hand still up maybe from the other question that we asked? Okay. It might still be up, Anna. We'll go ahead and move on. Okay. Um, as you read from the introduction on um, 
the website of this presentation, we're going to move into understanding what racial literacy is, but we want to define literacy again. And here is where windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors is going to grow as a metaphor. Um, literacy defined is the ability to identify, understand, interpret, create, compute, and communicate using visual, audible, and digital materials across disciplines in any context. I think a summary for me is reading the world, not just reading the word. And that's an important distinction to make because racial literacy is about understanding racial situations. No one is going to spell it out for you explicitly or most of the time that won't be the case. But it's our ability to actually read those situations from a racial lens and then interpret, analyze and act. So using this definition of literacy, um, and applying it to racial context is really where we're gonna grow in understanding. Um, as we talked just how important this is, it, it allows us and empowers us to engage and connect and communicate things that we want. It allows us to interact in the world. So again, building on this definition of literacy and applying it to um, race, racial literacy is this ability to actually read these situations. So Shalia, you wanna talk specifically about definition as Howard Stevenson has described it? Absolutely. You know, looking at racial literacy as the ability to identify, understand, and interpret racialized creations and communications across disciplines in any context. Um, but also the ability to read, recast, and resolve racially stressful social interactions. I'll just pause here because putting this into practice um, could mean that we are not reading words, but we're reading a situation, mm -hmm. we're interpreting it, we're analyzing it internally, and then we're resolving whatever feelings we have, or we are finding empowerment to actually overcome whatever stress or feelings that we are um, experiencing to address the situation. That is racial literacy. To be racially literate, you're gonna go through all of those kind of steps, reading, recasting, and then resolving. Absolutely. And we love this uh, quote by Stevenson. He just kind of says that if we hope to heal the racial tensions that threaten to tear the fabric of society apart, we're going to need the skills to openly express ourselves in racially stressful situations. Um, and so developing our racial literacy skills is how together we can heal ourselves, one another, and our communities. And so as you think about why racial literacy might be important, as you think about that definition and um, the work of Howard Stevenson, why is racial literacy important in your personal life, um, in your professional life, but also as educators working in communities that are committed to being inclusive? And we'll hop into gallery for just a moment to, to unpack a bit of why is racial literacy important in our personal lives, in our professional lives, and as educators committed um, to being in inclusive communities. First. <laughs> Everybody's waiting. Who's going to go? Um, so I think, so I'm, I'm at Foxcroft School, which is a very small all-girls school in Middleburg, Virginia. And prior to this, my job, I was uh, the director of DC uh, program, director of library programs for DC public schools. So I went from DCPS to Foxcroft. And um, so a, a lot of dissonance in my experiences, but also great opportunities. And I think personally, when um, my son uh, was, went to Duke Ellington School of the Arts, uh, where he's a vocal major, so he was the only white kid in his program. And he sang with children by the gospel choir, uh, where he was the only white kid in the program. And great opportunities to be to live in, in a situation as the only and um, recognize how little we have uh, to experience that on a day-to-day -day basis. So personally, it's being able to recognize that there's so much that I don't know that I don't know and mm -hmm. being open to um, learning and hearing and listening and mm -hmm. recognizing who I am and, and the, the privilege that I carry with me every single minute of every single day as an educator and as a human being. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yes, thank you. Thanks, DZ. We also think, you know, intentionally about the professional and the personal. 
-hmm. You know, maybe <laughs> as we think about anti-racism and as we think about racial literacy, what are some, you know, or what's something that stands out to you of the significance of the personal and the professional growth happening simultaneously? Hi, I'm Andrea. Um, I just wanted to pop in and say, I mean, yeah, this is about us being human beings and living in the world and being in relationship to one another and particularly working with children and youth, like how do we raise them into relationship with one another and as a community. Um, yeah, and there's a lot to learn. So I'm grateful for this conversation. We are too, I'm grateful that you're here as well. Right. And, um, you know, Shalia, I, I think we, did, we should probably define or share how we are thinking about the term anti-racism. It's not um, the way we're using and interpreting it here is, um, is not that we are um, ignoring racial identity. It is acknowledging, in fact, that um, we as practitioners need to identify and honor the racial identities that we bring into a space and then work to be aware and conscious and dismantle any systems or any policies that we have that work counter or against any particular race. Um, Shalia, you wanna add more? We, Shalia led us through a book study on how to be an anti-racist, so. Um, Absolutely. Just, you know, the idea that so many of our independent schools, even if we're serving predominantly uh, students of color, um, the, the ideas and the, the practice and a lot of our ways of knowing so far have been so rooted in dominant culture um, that the intentional need for us to take a look at our practices and policies um, is part of our anti-racism work, right? I think Ibram Kendi would describe it in his book as if it's not intentionally anti-racist, it's definitely not neutral. Yeah, yeah. And he would also, he makes really a claim early on that we're all racists in some ways, that if we're, if we're not standing up and not interrogating our communities and our spaces through that lens, through this lens, that um, we could be contributing. So, and I, um, what Shalia and I are, are um, arguing today is that we really need to look at race in the workplace and race in our professional practice as another ism, just as we would um, perhaps uh, at different measures and at different rates individually be more comfortable perhaps calling out sexism or um, homophobia or any of the other oppressive isms, so too must we build up our racial literacy skills so that we feel comfortable and confident to call racism out and to identify it um, in, those, in our spaces as well. And so here are uh, a number of isms um, and phobias that we are putting here just to share with you. I think we all could probably go through and um, identify maybe isms or phobias that we are more comfortable addressing or speaking about. And so that's a reflective point for us. Um, why are we, why are you, why, are, why am I more comfortable perhaps communicating discomfort about this ism or phobia instead of race? Or more comfortable co discussing this ism and phobia more than I am comfortable discussing race. So just um, let's stay here for just a couple of seconds and have you, uh, not necessarily share if you don't want to, but just maybe jot these down or um, this, as I said, um, angle that we're presenting how important anti-racism in the workplace is. I think um, for me, when I think about um, how many times I've heard a comment about a colleague's age um, mm -hmm. and how explicit policies are about, um, you know, anti-harassment and um, anti-sexism policies as, you know, a, a, an offense that can result in termination, but it doesn't always seem that racist <laughs> um, practices or comments or 
actions are met with the same type of outcome. I appreciate it. I'm seeing some nods. Um, and again, Shalia and I do want this to feel like a conversation with you. So if at any time you want to unmute or raise your hand and jump in, you're more than welcome to. Rob, see your hand. Hi, Rob. Uh, I work in uh, yeah. traffic. And, you know, and Rob, I appreciate you sharing that because we also acknowledge that not everyone is at an institution where they feel as if they'll be backed up if they do respond to one of these isms or phobias in their community. And that is something that I am thankful for about uh, my community at Beauvoir, but I recognize that that is not everyone's reality. And if you're in a community that um, that might not be your reality right now, we do have some ideas of maybe some initial first steps that you can take to bring your community along that path at the end of our, our conversation today. Absolutely. We'd love to spend some time the next 10 minutes. We know that sometimes in larger groups, it's just um, harder to engage sometimes. And so maybe spending the next 10 minutes in small groups to discuss how we see the isms and phobias showing up in the workplace. Um, and a, just a reminder um, as you go into those spaces and then come back um, of sharing from the eye perspective and um, being mindful of equity and voice, equity of voice in those conversations, and even sitting with who it's easier to listen to and who it's easier to tune out um, as they as they share. Okay, welcome back. First of all, just checking in. How was that? What things stood out to you in some of your conversations? Oh, we have a few more folks coming back. All right, so just a check-in. How was that? What things stood out for you in your conversations uh, with others? What things are you continuing to, to think about or want to continue to think about as you um, leave later this afternoon? Um, but what came up for you? Well, our group just commented on the, um, you know, school's engagement now um, with um, professional development and those kinds of things now, but still the reluctance among actual conversations and actual personal um, engagements um, to engage in conversation or to engage in these kinds of practices. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. Um, my group touched a bit on every school and institution these days recognizes there's issues, um, but if they're not authentically working to change them it, with all the different initiatives that are out, if they're not actually like at the core changing, then what's the point of that? So you might institute a new curriculum and new initiative, but if the core of the school is staying the same, is it really working? Mm -hmm. mm. That's okay. I think um, CC something that we'll touch upon is um, how destructive uh, traumatic stress, especially really related to race, is for a human a human body, and you'll see a lot of quotes. And that has been something that has been an entry point into taking the conversation um, to another level with our community to find that, you know, this is no longer going to be tolerated. And, and, you know, if you need scientific evidence of how destructive racial trauma can be, here is some research and here are some quotes. And um, I hope that that could be something compelling for, for school communities, but I agree. I, I've certainly worked in some or um, consulted with some who are in that same situation not yet willing to confront or actually read that situation, that racial situation in the correct way. Hmm. I'm seeing in the comments uh, from Jennifer B, I noticed that there's often a desire to have the or have this come from the outside, a curriculum, a consultant, rather than starting the work with ourselves first. It's hard work. And I think that's interesting because I do think, you know, thinking of Sam, your comment, 
I think there is right now um, sort of a sense of urgency in terms of our response to some of our alums saying, well, what's going on? Or those black ad accounts that we talked about a bit earlier. But if we're not mindful, it can come across as very performative for mm -hmm. us to, to start doing X, Y, or Z and you know, communicating that this is where we're going, right? Or this is who we're bringing in. Um, instead of recognizing that each individual makes up this institution and each individual has a personal and professional responsibility mm -hmm. in addition to those things, right? Any other, you know, things that came up for you in your conversations or something that stood out to you or that you want to continue um, unpacking? Jennifer, did you go to unmute? That's yes. like the universe. I apologize because I, I will contribute way too much. So just tell me to stop. But um, I did a lot of um, hiring in DCPS when we were looking to rebuild the library programs and all the schools. The one issue that I came up with time and time and time again was having to have very indirect conversations with people um, who were unaware that they were suffering from white savior syndrome. Mm -hmm. And their hearts were in the right place and they wanted to help. And it was a rough conversation to have every time um, because it's, you know, again, people feel that they're doing the right thing and they, they want to help and they want to do, but they're not looking internally mm -hmm. first. And so that's, I'm, I'm experiencing some of that oh, now as well. It's just an interesting thing that keeps happening. Yeah. Mm. Um, there's a great book. I think Lisa Delpit, um, despite the best intentions. Um, also, just speaking from a white and ally perspective, we had um, great, I would say success, just based on the surveys that I sent before the book study and after the book study, um, reading Waking Up White by Debbie Irving. And if um, that's not a book that, a title that you're familiar with, it was really, I think, a, an approach for um, white members of our community who weren't quite sure where they were what they were feeling or how they were wanting to talk about or think about um, their whiteness. And through reading her story and her perspectives and the way that she delivers the information and um, embraces discomfort, that was, I saw a big growth in our, um, my white colleagues, just how capable and more comfortable they felt talking about their own identity and then engaging in conversation um, about other racial identities too. Any final thought from our time in small groups before we move on? From Raina, or am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. From Raina in the chat, it's also important to see how these isms and phobias intersect and how they are not singular things, absolutely. Addressing racism also involves addressing how class, gender, and sexuality play into these dynamics at school. Right, and I appreciate that point, um, Raina. I think sometimes when we talk about anti-racism, um, the perception is that it is an exclusive conversation, right? Well, why are we only discussing race? But when we talk about <laughs> the, the intersecting identities, right? Um, I think that's just a very important piece um, to add. So thank you for bringing that to the discussion. So we started our conversation um, understanding literacy and applying um, literacy to uh, racial literacy and used Howard Stevenson's definition of being able to read, recast, and then resolve a racial experience or situation as a step towards racial literacy. Um, then we talked about how important it is to build our capacity and skill in racial literacy and understanding um, its significance in the workplace, understanding that racism is unfortunately, another ism that we um, as practitioners and professionals um, need to be uh, aware of, conscious of, um, and also unfortunately combat in some communities. And now we wanna move into um, why there's urgency here. And as Shalia mentioned, and we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, you know, the black at accounts certainly um, were as I said, the word intentionally testimonies of experiences that our students and colleagues have had in, institute, in independent schools. The world that we are living in currently, just down the street from um, me and Shalia. Um, and that brings its own stress 
So we want to talk about just stress in the body, and then we'll talk about racial stress and the damage that it actually does to a human body. Um, the brain is a beautiful organ. The innermost system of the brain, the part of our brain that, that evolved first is called the limbic system. And it's a, a group of different um, parts of the brain that work together. And it's the emotional center. It's also the learning center of the brain. It's um, why uh, we feel so deeply. It's also the center of the brain that is not the thinking brain, okay? That's the neocortex, the part that surrounds that inner structure of the brain. And the reason why this is important is that our bodies, we, as we said, we feel things first. So um, Rene Descartes wasn't quite accurate. I think, therefore I am. It's actually, I feel, <laughs> therefore I think. So the same reason why you might be walking down the sidewalk and think that you see a snake, um, you jump or you startle, but then you realize it's just a branch. Your body had a stressful reaction to what it was seeing until your neocortex, your thinking brain, was able to put it into context and say, okay, actually, that's just a branch. Our bodies do that in situations where we find stress. We are wired, literally, to feel things first and then process them later. But when we experience intense feelings, that limits our ability to regulate those emotions in a, in a way that allows for really sound cognition. And so we think about Howard Stevenson's definition in those reading, recasting, and resolving racial situations. We need to move our bodies into a place or aim to move our bodies into a place where we're able to feel and sit with those feelings of discomfort, but still cognitively be aware of what's happening to read a situation. Um, something that I also um, really appreciate, Jill, Jill Bolte Taylor, she had a great TED talk. It was one of the most watched TED talks for quite a bit of time. She was a neuroscientist who had a stroke and she had some great insights on what it was like um, as she was not able to speak, but she was very aware and, and pre present minded. Um, and as she developed her ability to speak again, she has these great reflections and she talks about um, being in responsible for the energy that we bring into spaces as human beings. And I, I want to extend that. Now, she was speaking from a, more of a spiritual um, context after she had this um, experience with a stroke. But I think it's also relevant to being responsible for the spaces that we occupy uh, racially, our racial identities and the spaces that we bring in. Um, excuse me, the, the energy and the racial identity that we bring into a space, being responsible for that. And I do feel that as uh, a white educator walking into a room full of students, full of colleagues, I am understanding that I am white. And if you have colleagues who say, I really don't identify as white, or I really don't, um, I don't want to, you know, claim that I am white, others are going to see and perceive you as a white person. Um, and we want to build that capacity for our white colleagues to understand their racial identity, but then also take responsibility for that as well when we're entering spaces together. Mm -hmm. Julie, is there anything that you, that I may have missed or that you would like to add? No, I, you know, I love hearing you talk about uh, the brain and our responses. And when we think about um, prolonged stressful situations and how we don't perform at our best <laughs> in prolonged stressful situations. And so if we're feeling stress as someone experiencing trauma, our body is going to respond negatively. And so when we think about the importance of developing racial coping strategies as a community, it's also important that we remember and understand and empathize how traumatic racial stress can be to the bodies and minds of some of our community members. Um, and it is a critical need in each of our paths to making our entire community healthy and inclusive to acknowledge that we are experiencing things differently on our campuses. And so taking a look more into um, how racial trauma uh, shows up in the body and the brain. Um, Dr. DeGray, from those who've heard, um, or Dr. DeGru, um, has a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome and says that racial trauma refers to the mental and physical effects of racism on Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and it can be passed through generations and vicariously. So I do not have to personally experience that to feel it, which is much of what I felt during the summer as I watched and watched different headlines pop up of different black folks being murdered, right? 
The effects of racism have been shown to produce symptoms similar to those that we see in folks with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And that also um, racial trauma causes a decrease in the sense of safety uh, for the person experiencing the racialized moment. It's fight, flight, or freeze. How do I respond in this specific moment at this specific time? And so if we put ourselves in the position to think about our students or our colleagues or ourselves and navigating some of our professional spaces and what it's like to experience racial trauma um, and to have to choose how to operate in each moment. Is there something that sticks out to you before we move forward about what we've talked about so far in terms of the body, the brain, and trauma? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I mean, uh, so much of this, um, especially just when I think about the PTSD side of it and PTSD is really, I shouldn't say really, but oftentimes it's not associated with, with race and racial trauma. Um, and as someone who's, who's, you know, really going through the PTSD effects of that right now, it's, it's so real. And I put it out there because I think it's, I don't want to say that it's safe to say that most People of color are are dealing with those effects right now but it's almost like assume that they probably are because it it has been very very challenging and this goes beyond I think just regular day-to-day -day stressors of you know working in a school system mm -hmm. um, but it's it it's heavy it is very heavy and it's very different than just regular stress. Mm -hmm. Thank you for adding that, Jessica. Yeah, I, I also, it's hard for me to, um, it's just hard for me, period. <laughs> it's hard for me when um, schools may claim that they, this might not apply to them or their students might not have be feeling this way or have experienced racial trauma or their colleagues haven't colleagues of color um, because clearly you know the black ad accounts have revealed a different truth and when you see some, these definitions and, and these um, experts and then some of the quotes that we'll read before there's a call to urgency for us um, especially white colleagues to really start carrying the torch and bringing other white colleagues along understanding what and how racial trauma impacts the body and the brain. And we are not dismissing the other traumas related to the other isms and phobias that we've talked about. We're just really focusing on racial trauma. And if we frame, maybe this is a piece of the toolkit as well. Mm -hmm. If we can frame our understanding about how trauma affects our students, right? Or frame that to our colleagues and our institutions, understanding the impact that calling that student repeatedly by a different name of the of another black student right or whatever those small moments are that we consider microaggressions they're not micro right they're micro in terms of the interpersonal they're not micro in terms of the impact the impact is violent and harmful mm -hmm. and so reframing how we think about um, the ways that our students experience school and the effect that it has um, on them. Feeling stressed at school does not equal learning. Your body will truncate that learning process the minute it feels any heightened sense of stress. Here is our contact information before we go into gallery. If you'd like to connect with us at any point, we are, are here. I'm going to stop the share. I would love to see some of the chat. I can't, <laughs> I can't see it when I'm sharing the screen, but feeling grateful and tired and grateful. That's real, <laughs> tired and grateful. So, so drained, mm -hmm. worried about tomorrow. Same here, I'm thankful to be here. Eager and encouraged and more encouraged. Mm. Grateful for the standout resource. 
Friends, are there anything, is there anything that while Anna and I are here, we have six more minutes, if you'd like to ask a question or you want a thought partner really quickly in something, Anna, can you think of, um, Sandra, I see you um, just unmute it. I'm with the, though I've had private school experience as a student, in Brooklyn, um, I'm in the New York City Department of Education. And I'm comfortable with making the transition because I understand independent schools, the thought process is different, the process, the, it's, a, it's a different mindset. I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so to be truly authentic to myself, I do have some worry that you would worry that I could make that transition and how would that best be delivered from me that while being anchored here, mm -hmm. while being a career changer, um, how that can be viewed not as a detriment to be able to make the transition, but how, how to present that so you see that as an asset. So though anchored here, opportunities have been made available. And I'm speaking for myself. I'm speaking personally, again, my authentic self. Um, I, with, without a, a sense of defensiveness, um, the body of work, again, because it's a, it's a different mindset, you know, how do you trust that the transition can be done? Mm. Because I believe it can be, but you know, has the awakening happened across the board, you know, with first mm -hmm. acknowledging that we need this and then acknowledging that those who might be able to provide could come from a variety of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, yeah. I didn't put worry in, but I could have once I saw worry in there. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I'm so sorry. No, I'm, I'm just repeating myself. It's, it's how do you trust that the transition can indeed happen? Yeah. I um, as someone who actually and I both work on a hiring committee, a hiring team, so we're, we're at Carnegie Sandow different fairs and interviewing a lot of, of people, perhaps some, some things that might be good for you going in or thinking about this experience for yourself is you're absolutely right. I think what you just shared, if that comes across on paper, on a resume or in a statement, or if you just shared that across the table when, when we had tables, <laughs> but across the Zoom room, yes. I think that alone would open the door and, and have a conversation. I think what would be really important um, is for you as a candidate to, to ask a school a question that really targets or has them reveal an answer to, sh to reveal where they are on a journey. Similarly, when we're interviewing candidates, there's a list of uh, cultural competency questions that we'll ask. And so I might say, why don't you tell me about uh, a recent professional development conversation you engaged in around racial equity? And if you're not able to have that give me, you know, provide an answer or that's not a part of your conversation, that is sure not gonna be a good uh, yeah. help for anybody. Yeah. Uh, so maybe thinking about something that you could ask the school to mm -hmm. see, you know, where they are on their journey, because I, you know, I, I think we have a just working in independent schools. And I also came, I was in the school district of Philadelphia before I, I um, came to Beauvoir and I have gone back and forth between independent school and public school, but independent schools by and large are all on different journeys. Mm -hmm. It's going to be you know, your due diligence to look at the website and yes. see how you feel about a school community space and if you want to join that community. But thinking about one or two questions that either you ask the school, because I don't think, I know, I know there are some schools that are not on a place in their journey where they will ask you about 
cultural competency. And so if you have that question to ask them, that might be revealing for you, make you feel more comfortable moving forward or not. Thank you. It's yeah. a great question, Sandra. Thank you for asking that. Johanna? That was actually gonna be my question. Um, I'm looking at new school communities at the moment and how, as a candidate, do you ask those questions of a school without the school doing, I love the word performance, uh, and that there's these like very performative aspects of we're on this journey and we're doing all this work and people are really good at making websites that make their schools look really diverse. What kinds of questions can I ask to try to peel back that, if that makes sense? Yeah, that makes really good sense. It does. I think honestly, just doing some doing some more digging, right? The interview process, I have never been through an interview process quite like the independent school interview process. It is a full day or just a full schedule of meeting different people in the community. And that was new for me um, with independent schools. But I think being able to meet with different folks and ask different folks questions. And if you get the opportunity, so for example, as director of DEI, if I am meeting with a candidate, that is an opportunity if you're not picking it up in other spaces to ask the DEI director to be real with you about school culture, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you're feeling as if you're, um, if you're feeling as if it's heavy on the language and you're concerned about whether that language is actually um, showing up in action, I think just meeting with different constituents um, or different um, educators in the school is an opportunity to, to see how other folks are talking about it or mm -hmm. to ask more you know, specific you know, questions. So when was the last equity and justice PD? You know, or can you tell us about, it? is there a committee that's devoted to taking a look at the curriculum mm -hmm. or, you know, how do you support parents in learning or, um, um, you know, just asking specific questions about the last time, right? Like when is it an ongoing or was this a one-off in terms of the professional development and trying mm -hmm. to get a better understanding of, is this something that was checked off or is this something that's a part of the culture might be helpful. Yeah, and I will, it's five o'clock on a Tuesday, so I will be candid. If a school sends a representative to this conference to interview you who can't answer those questions, then that school really is not in the right realm for you. It, that's a, for me, would be a really big red flag, especially, at, I mean, I think any hiring representative from a school, truly, and that would be my expectation, but you know, if, if it's not. Also, um, Shalia and I put our email addresses on the last slide, but we'll drop them in the chat too. Rosetta Lee has some fantastic um, cultural competency, competency questions, not only for schools, but for candidates to ask schools. And you might be able to feel inspired from some of her work to modify questions that feel comfortable for you. Thanks, Shalia. Thank you. 